They are innovators, game changers, people pushing themselves, moving us all forward. They are the next scientists, musicians, poets, the next makers, dreamers, teachers, and geniuses. They are the next list. He's creating new life forms. In my mind, the environment is one of the most important reasons to do it, but it's also about energy security. Engineering cells that can produce medicines, fuels, even cosmetic compounds, all from simple ingredients, like sugarcane or grass. One day, I think you'll be a Nobel Prize winner. The carpet on the floor, the paint on the walls, the ceiling tiles, they all come from petroleum. We have the potential to produce all of these products from sugar. Jay Keesling is a pioneer in synthetic biology, a field even he didn't know existed just 10 years ago. The, the, the term synthetic biology, yes. what does that mean? That means engineering biology to do things that it wouldn't naturally do. Today, Keesling's man-made microbes are having a profound impact from a new low-cost anti-malarial drug. The product will be on the market in 2013. That means 100 million people will be impacted by the scientific discovery. To cleaner, more efficient alternatives to gas and ethanol. They can be programmed to save lives one day, the environment the next. Sound like science fiction? Well, get ready to step inside the Kiesling lab and meet a scientist hell-bent on a brighter future. I'm Dr. Sanjay Gupta, and this is The Next List. Energy is our biggest industry on the planet, but I think governments around the world need to realize that unless we stop putting carbon into the atmosphere, sea level is going to continue to rise and it's going to create huge problems. So what is JBay? JBay is a research institute. We do basic science on how to turn biomass into biofuels. It sounds pretty simple when you put it like that. It's not so simple. It's actually really complicated work. I'm Jay Kiesling and I'm a synthetic biologist. The Joint Bioenergy Institute, or as we call it, JBay, is funded through the Department of Energy, uh, and it's funded at a level of $25 million a year. So our goal here is to engineer microbes to produce fuels that behave exactly the same as petroleum-based fuels. So you can put them into your tank, and if you have a gasoline car, they would behave the same. We call them drop-in biofuels. And those are fuels or blend stocks, uh, molecules, that are identical to those that are in fuels today. Most people hear microbes and they think something that can cause a problem, cause an infection. You look at microbes and see what? I see little chemical factories. Um, and in fact, that's how we treat them. A microbe is generally considered to be a single-celled organism. So not a multicellular organism like I am, but a single cell organism would be like a yeast. We use it to make bread, we use it to make beer, we use it to make wine, and it's been used for centuries. Yeast has is, is got inside it an amazing ability to do different kinds of chemistry. This map of all these different chemicals and pathways is basically what yeast can do chemically. One. Yeast, we know, is really good at taking in sugars, like sucrose, this is what you'd put in your coffee. And then it can take it through a series of chemical reactions, and I can find my way right down here to ethanol. Ethanol is okay in gasoline, as a small percentage, as an oxygenate, but it's not a great fuel. It doesn't have the full fuel value of the petroleum-based fuels we use, and it can't be used as a diesel fuel or a jet fuel. What we want to do is reroute this pipeline going down over to this part of the map, which these are the hydrocarbons. I mean, hydrocarbons are what petroleum is, so, and our world is built on petroleum, so there's lots of things that you could do. And the way we do this is by engineering the genes, so changing their genetic makeup changes the chemistry that goes on inside them. Once you figure out how you want to tweak it, what genetic material needs to be in the, in the microbe or the plant, how do you do it? Well, what, what's the process of actually doing that? Well, that process has been around for 40 years, right? In the early 70s, we learned how to clone DNA. We learned how to cut pieces of DNA that contain genes and to splice them into another piece of DNA. And that technology has come a long way. In the last 40 years, 
to the point now where it's not just one gene that we can cut and splice, it's many genes. So this is, this is an example of some of the coding that people have been doing, putting together these pieces of DNA. What that actually ends up giving you is colonies of yeast in a grid fashion like this that are all the output of coding you've done in the DNA. So from the computer into a living yeast cell. Is there any danger to this? Like if these microbes got out uh, or were not adequately sterilized, could they be a problem? There's two answers to that. The first is um, we're working to make sure that those microbes don't survive. So we can actually build kill switches in them so that um, they will self-destruct once they get out of the tank. We can build in mechanisms that uh, give them a, a nutrient source in the tank that they'd never find out in nature. Um, and the third answer is that these microbes have been so heavily engineered, they won't compete. Gotcha. So they're not going to go out there and suddenly turn a bunch of sugar that's in wastewater into oil. That's right. That's right. They're not even going to survive. Our first big success using synthetic biology was to engineer a yeast to produce a precursor to anti-malarial drug artemisinin. It's a 95% effective cure against uncomplicated malaria, meaning 95% of the time you'll take the drug, three days later you'll be cured of malaria. Our first big success using synthetic biology was to engineer a yeast to produce a precursor to anti-malarial drug artemisinin. We were engineering microbes to produce chemicals, and one of my graduate students happened on a paper that described this drug that treats malaria. It's a 95% effective cure against uncomplicated malaria, meaning 95% of the time you'll take the drug, three days later you'll be cured of malaria. The problem is it comes from a plant which is seasonally in short supply. And so we uh, read about artemisinin, we looked at the chemical structure, and we said, boy, I think we can make that. And that's where the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation came in. So they put in the first tranche of money that uh, allowed us to work on the anti-malarial and give it away for free. The product will be on the market in 2013. They plan to produce 100 million treatments annually. That means 100 million people will be impacted by the scientific discovery. Their lives will be made better or their children's lives could be saved. That project allowed us to start Amaris. We brought together some really fantastic scientists, a small team, um, to nucleate Amaris, and it's blossomed into a 500-person company. And I think that's what Jay gave to his students, to the founders of Amaris, a chance to move from the lab to to the real world. At its foundation, Amaris is an integrated renewable products company. So we bring renewable products to the marketplace. Currently, most of our effort is in the recoding to make something called farnesine. Farnesine is a hydrocarbon, very high performance hydrocarbon that can be used to make all different kinds of products. It can produce flavors and fragrances that we find in our perfumes, uh, that we find in uh, some of our processed foods, even in things like detergents to make them smell better. The one most people know about uh, and what's running the buses in Brazil is the diesel. At the base of all of this is sugar, and it's why we're here in Brazil, and this is sort of ground zero of sugar production. Why? Because sugar is ultimately the most basic source of energy. É, a safra normal de cana, é, na nossa unidade, ela tem início em abril e final em, fev... em novembro. Esses nove meses de colheita, a gente trabalha 24 horas por dia. Brazil will produce about 500 to 600 million tons of cane this year. Generally, most of these mills, about half of it uh, would go to make raw sugar, sugar that we'll consume in our food, and then the other half tends to go for ethanol. In the case of Paraíso, what they're basically doing is reducing the amount of ethanol they're going to produce and taking some of that sugar cane and, in essence, selling it to Amaris. We need that sugar to, f to basically feed microorganisms, in our case yeast, that are going to eat that sugar, take that energy, and produce hydrocarbons, oils. 
truck comes in, they'll use hydraulics to dump all that cane into uh, what are in essence large uh, shredding machines. Think of very large garbage disposals, right? And it will crush all of that and squeeze every little bit of juice, which is water and sucrose in it, and separate that from the bagasse, the straw. Amherst will take that juice from Paraiso. It will come up via pipe system and we will purify that to a point and sterilize it so that we can then produce our, our products. So this is a control room to monitor the uh, fermentation process uh, where we convert sugar into furnacing, mainly monitoring or controlling pH, airflow rate, temperature, and, and things like that. This is, a, this is a mixture of yeast, water, and farnesine. Uh, that oil that's in there, farnesine, that hydrocarbon, is uh, less dense than water. So if you let this sit, it'll just float to the top. But we have a way to do that a little bit faster uh, by just using something like a dairy creamer. And what that'll do is separate basically the cream, the oil, farnesine, which is going to come out in here, uh, from all the other stuff. Yeast, basically water and salt is, the, is what's left. So this is about 93, 95% pure. We do a quick cleanup step and it's water white. It's more than 98% pure. We hydrogenate it and it becomes diesel that you'd use in a bus in Rio or Sao Paulo. Currently, everything comes from petroleum. As renewables come online, uh, what I would like to do is have Amherst be the company that showed people that you could get materials from something other than petroleum. My father said to me, are you trying to put me out of business? And I said, no, it's exactly the opposite. We want to help American agriculture. We want to give farmers other crops to produce. I grew up on a farm in Nebraska. Um, it was a farm that's been in my family for five generations. The first 18 years of my life, I s had the smell of pig manure on my hands. <laughs> we go back to Nebraska twice a year uh, to see my father, to see my sister and her family, and the boys just love it. So it's still very close to my heart. And I'd like to return something to Nebraska, to the farm economy, because I think they deserve it. Energy is our biggest industry. 225 billion gallons of transportation fuels alone in the US, so it's gonna take a lot of biomass. The typical plant is about two-thirds sugar, whether it's a tree in the forest or the grass in your lawn. Those sugars can be used to produce fuels, but in order to produce the fuels, we have to get the sugars out of the plant. Now, the genetic modification of the plant could make this process much easier. For instance, we might be able to extract the sugars much faster using the genetically modified plant than the normal plant. So you're doing two things. You're genetically modifying the plants to have more right. sugar available, and you're genetically modifying microbes to then use that sugar. Exactly, exactly. What we really want is a plant that grows well and at the same time is able to release its sugars when we want them released. Is there an ideal plant from what you've learned so far? There's no one plant that's going to be the silver bullet. Um, it'll all depend on the climate and the location. So in the U.S. Midwest, the Plain States might have switchgrass. Uh, the Pacific Northwest might have trees. The very deep south could have sugarcane. Uh, so it all depends on the climate, the amount of rain, sunshine, etc. Let me guess where you're originally from, Nebraska. Oh. Corn stover. And the, the interesting thing about corn stover is we could have our food, the corn, and use the rest of the crop for producing energy. Right, right. Sounds like I mean, you're, you're, you're changing agriculture. We hope to change agriculture. Um, when we got the grant, um, we said that we were going to do uh, fuels that could go in all modes of transportation, not ethanol, and that we were going to use cellulosic crops rather than corn, which is a food crop. Uh, my father said to me, are you trying to put me out of business? And I said, no, it's exactly the opposite. We want to help American agriculture. We want to give farmers other crops to produce. 
farmers could be producing our energy as well as our food. Well, what does that mean uh, in, in terms of the average person's uh, life? I mean, w w will products be cheaper? What, what does it mean for them? Let me answer this in a couple of ways. So first, uh, we use about 225 billion gallons of transportation fuels in the U.S. on an annual basis. That's diesel, that's jet fuel, that's gasoline. Um, to replace about a third of that will take about 100 million acres. The U.S. has about 450 million farmed acres. So that's about a quarter of the farmed land in the U.S. And that's going to take many generations to do. And it's not going to be cheaper for the American citizen, right? It's going to be cleaner. It'll also be homegrown. What's the downside? The downside is it's going to take us a while to get there. It's going to take money to get there. Do, do you feel a sense of urgency? I mean, is, is there, is there the, the drum beat for you to move as fast as you can here? Well, I mean, you know, the sea is rising, right? And now we've got uh, half of the world population in China and India that want to have the same lifestyle as ours. So there's huge urgency here. two sons, they're adopted. We adopted them when they were very young, one four months and one two weeks old. They're great. I don't know that they'll end up being scientists, um, although my older son is getting very enthusiastic about chemistry and math, so there's hope. Oh, Esther's. They do see that I spend a fair amount of time working, and so they think I work too hard and that all scientists work this hard. I tried to explain to them that not everybody works as hard as I do. You never know if something's going to be a success. Uh, things can fail. And in fact, I would argue that a fair fraction of things you do should fail. Otherwise, you're not, um, you're not being entrepreneurial enough or you're not being, taking enough risk. You have to be patient and watch something grow. And, Oftentimes, things will go through bubbles. We saw this with the biofuels business, for instance, where it was overhyped. But if we have patience, I'm sure that we can get there. And there's a great case study, and that's Brazil. In the late 70s, Brazil and the US were on track to do research and produce fuels. In the early 80s, we stopped all of that research in the US. And in Brazil, they just kept going. And just a few years ago, they became petroleum independent. In the U.S., we restarted all of that research about five years ago, and we're trying to play catch up. But we'll get there as long as the government has steady policies, and policies that at least balance favorably biofuels with petroleum-based fuels. Oil companies have invested heavily in renewables, and to be frank, if we're going to get renewable fuels in people's tanks, it's going to be through the petroleum companies because they're the ones who have the pipelines, they have the trucks that will get it to the gas stations, they have some of the gas stations. So they're an important part of it. And from their perspective, I think they would want a piece of it. I don't think we'll ever see a day when biofuels cost less than petroleum-based fuels. Biofuels have the advantage that they don't put additional carbon into the atmosphere. When we take petroleum from the ground and we refine it into fuels, and then we burn those fuels in our engine, that puts excess carbon into the atmosphere that wasn't there before. When you make fuels from sugars, those sugars in the plant are made taking carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere, makes the plant material, we turn the plant material into the fuel, you burn it in your car, and then the carbon goes back. So you have a complete cycle, a carbon cycle. And if you're really good in this process, it can be carbon neutral. This means that we won't put additional carbon in the atmosphere, we won't have global warming to the degree that we have it now, and we might save the planet from increases in temperature. Is, is there a point now when you look at the work that you're doing and say, I will one day be done? I don't think I'll ever be done. Um, because there are always more things to do. And, and as the capabilities increase, as we're able to uh, build more inside a microbe or inside a plant, that just opens up huge possibilities. You know, there are so many big problems that we could solve, and a lot of them we could solve with biology. We spend a huge amount of energy and money putting fertilizer on crops like corn. In fact, we spend about 1% of the world's energy just making fertilizer for corn in the U.S. 
if that corn could take the nitrogen out of the air and fix it like beans, legumes do, then we wouldn't have to fertilize corn. Another important problem, we don't have enough drugs for diseases. We see these multi-drug resistant microbes popping up in hospitals and it's kind of scary. We need better drugs. I think this is an area where synthetic biology can really help. If you look around this room, nearly everything that we're in contact with is derived from petroleum. The carpet on the floor, the paint on the walls, the ceiling tiles, they all come from petroleum. We have the potential to produce all of these products from sugar. So it could open up an entirely new avenue um, for agriculture. It could open up an environmentally friendly way to produce all of these products that we use on a day-to-day -day basis. Is that, is that part of what drives you? I mean, do you look at the world just differently as a result of knowing how sugar could be substitute for these petroleum-based products? I don't know if I look at the world that differently. I, I have a, a, a very good hammer, and so I see a lot of nails. And I see that we could use this tool that we have, this capability, to make lives better. And so I think it's, it's one of my goals is to try to make the world a better place. By reprogramming cells to produce cleaner, more efficient versions of the fuels and other chemicals we've all grown so dependent on, Jay Keesling has opened the door to a brighter, more sustainable future. And that's what puts him on the next list. I'm Dr. Sanjay Gupta. Hope to see you back here next Sunday.